now to discuss his work on France Fanon is Abe Silberstein, author of a paper titled Who's, Who's Post-Colonialism? The Coming Struggle Over Palestine in the Academy. You gave a very subtle reading of Fanon. Fanon is the subject of polemics and people wave his book around uh, as, as if it supports them in, in sometimes Literally, very... in some cases as a, yeah, as no. a demonstration sign. <laughs> right. No, really, as if it were, were, would legitimate almost any form of activism. And then um, nevertheless, he, he receives more careful attention in the academy. And uh, your paper pays close attention to the, to all that um to the to the vulgar readings of Fanon and to the more more um nuanced and uh how did you, so that's what we want to explore um and also how it relates to to the Hamas uh, program of, of October 7th because your paper actually raises the question or for me the concern that some people seem to be more interested in nuanced or refined or careful readings of Fanon, and some people much less so, even to the point that they protest against um, looking at, at, at Fanon in complex ways. Uh, there are people who are more interested, for example, in his book, Wretched of the Earth, and then there are those who are more interested in white skin. Black skin, black white black skin white masks uh some people read the first chapter of wretched of the earth and nothing more some read further and and read through the book some only read sartre's introduction i think um but in your paper you actually uh sort of separate out and, and distinguish and juxtapose um people right now fighting over the legacy of of Kana of, of fanon um, along along the, the these lines, didn't you in your paper and in your talk in a way suggest, but correct me if I'm wrong, that there are some people who seem more interested in a clear cut politics and don't want a complex phenomenon? And who 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 would you contrast them with? Your paper is called "The Struggle Over Phenomenon." Um, I mean, your paper struggle over post colonialism, but yes, but yeah. what you're saying so, about phenomenon yeah. is, is is perfectly accurate. Um, so there is, um, when it comes to Fanon, it, it's a problem with both some of his enthusiasts and his critics who want to reduce him to an advocate of, of wanton violence in the in the face of colonial struggle. Um, in, in, and that is a reading that comes through if one reads the first chapter of The Wretched of the Earth, especially if someone just reads Sartre's preface, which is the first chapter of The Wretched of the Earth, but even uh, less subtle um, than, than what Fanon says. And in fact, he injects things in there that Fanon didn't say at all, but that Sartre in, in some ways was in fact more radical than Fanon when it came to the use of, of violence, but that's perhaps another topic. Um, but you're correct that f there is there has been over the last couple of decades, in fact, a, a struggle over Fanon in the academy. Um, you, you can divide it in, in many different ways, but if we were to just do it in, in the most simplistic manner, which is probably best for a, for a podcast uh, presentation, there are those who, who see Fanon as being primarily a political or revolutionary thinker. And of course, those are, are the people who would view his work of political theory as the most important or the, the, or the preeminent um, Fanon, which is the wretched of the earth. Whereas there are those who favor a more psychoanalytic and literary reading of, of Fanon, um, which of course would lean towards black skin, white masks. Now, this division doesn't work perfectly because, you know, as there are various different people, for instance, who were making the arguments um, about psychoanalysis, um, literary theory, and post-colonialism in Fanon that don't overlap with each other at all. Um, you know, to give a quick example, both um, Homi Baba and um, Abdul Jan Mohammed were both readers, psycho Lacanian readers of Fanon, but differed very strongly on the implications um, for anti-colonial thinking and, and, and advocacy from that. So even though they were reading, 
in the same register and in the same style, they differed. But still, that reading, those readings are in contrast to, I would say, the more politically oriented or even militant readings of Fanon. Um, both people who only read the first chapter of The Wretched Youth, but also people who've read the entirety of Fanon and treat the Fanon of the Wretched of the Earth, the political Fanon, as the mature Fanon, in the words of Cedric Robinson, who is a, a political scientist, a Marxist political scientist, who is a, a strident critic of the psychoanalytic um, and literary readings of Fanon. And what I did with, with my paper was to was to take that struggle that mostly occurred in the 80s and 90s, but still um, happens at an at an undercurrent today, and and mapped it onto a newer controversy over post-colonialism, which is now I or at least I predict or project is going to be a struggle between Zionist or not even just Zionist, but people who are um, taking Zionism seriously and not just as an ideology to um, to 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 implacably oppose um, and anti-Zionists over post-colonialism. Um, I discussed in my paper a new collection of essays that came out from historians, um, many of whom are critical of, of, of Israel and Zionism and, and are not Zionists themselves. In fact, one or two are anti-Zionists. But they have been criticized for using post-colonial terminology, um, usually from someone like Homi Baba or Deepesh Chakrabarti, who didn't take a very binary view of colonizer and colonized, and instead looked for ways that they intersected or, or interacted with each other. And the, the idea of there being this isolated other was didn't make any sense to them or, or to their form of thinking. Um, and of course, the the counterattack to that is that we do need, you know, a colonizer or a colonized or a settler and a native. And so there is now a struggle over post-colonialism that has echoes, but not perfectly overlaps with the struggle over Fanon. And my paper was an initial attempt to put those in conversation and to try to tease out the meaning um, in, in an ongoing and unfolding situation that we are in. Whether or not they're Zionists, people interested in Zionism, maybe critical Zionists who were interested in engaging with Fanon in subtle ways. And, and was it not, I'm recalling your talk now that you gave um, and that we're here to explore more in depth, was it, was it not another group of scholars who reacted or responded or reacted to say, we don't really want you around here breaking down the binaries. Uh, we're essentially more interested in the political project of a clear colonizer colonized distinction for the purposes of political action. And you're uh, kind of elbowing your way in uh, to the to the discussion in ways that, uh, well, from your paper, as I recall, were, were strongly condemned or at least uh, was taken issue with by, by some other uh, folks. Wasn't it Jews, at least, if not Zionists, who wanted in on a complex discussion of Fanon and some people who didn't like that? Can you explain that? Yes. Yeah, so um, this collection of essays that I, I referenced before and referenced in my talk is uh, um, a collection edited by Derek Pensler of, of Harvard, as well as Arya Sapuznik and, and a few others who basically are, are scholars of Zionism. Um, the, the, con the contributors to this book have a variety of views on, on Zionism, and their project was to use terms from post-colonial theory or, or concepts from post colonial theory to try to understand Zionism and to try to understand the history of Zionism. Um, this, of course, on its face is not something that their critics would be opposed to, but their understanding of post-colonialism and indeed their understanding of Zionism is rather different um, from many of the contributors to this collection. So it wasn't a total surprise that it engendered criticism. I'm not opposed to people criticizing academic work. Um, and I think when it comes to uh, post-colonialism and Fanon in particular, there's this long running debate and an argument about um, the meaning and the purpose of, of these writings and these ideas. 
So this is, I, I don't think it's anything new. And that was also a, a second part of my argument, which was, which tried to discuss violence in that context, that we aren't, this isn't unique to Israel-Palestine, even though it's right now the, sh the, the struggle that we are in and what we're experiencing. This is actually something that's been discussed in many different contexts. Um, Fanon himself was engaged in this in the 1950s and, and, and early 60s when it came to devising the anti-colonial strategy of countries in Africa. So we're, we're still, I think, in that debate um, over how to... You know, whether or not one wants to consider Israel a, a colonial or settler colonial state, but the question of how one goes about opposing this thing that one might call colonialism or coloniality. And that's where I think this discussion is being centered. And it's not about the Jews or the Palestinians or Israel or Israel-Palestine as a specific location. Um, even though there is a that you know plays a role, mm -hmm. I still think we can learn a lot by understanding what's happening in the context of theoretical debates that have been taking place for decades. What is the thesis of your paper? What was the thesis of your talk? I've got some idea uh, from what you've said today. In fact, in fact, I know from having heard you speak about it and having read it. But for the listener, what's the th thesis? To, to put it as simply as possible, as I and I think I, I actually just touched on it in my answer to your previous question, is that to understand the response to October seventh in the academy, but also um, among among students who I guess are in the academy but may not be full members of it, um, how how they've responded to it. To understand that response, to understand that reaction, we would do well to know this history of struggle over over uh, over how to conduct an anti-colonial struggle and and which of course matters a lot when it comes to discussions of post-colonial theory so this is as and and as you know we've discussed this was actually a working paper and it's something that I'm you know reworking over the next couple of months and and refining but that's in a nutshell what my argument is and I tried in in a subtle manner to to frame it against what Carrie Nelson, my fellow panelist, was, was arguing on that panel, which was that this is mostly about, or even exclusively about anti-Semitism. Um, and that's what I might have been pushing back against, as I said, a little bit subtly, but I, I did so and wanted to focus on this, which is, it's not just theory, of course, this is this is practical politics as well, of how to conduct an anti-colonial struggle or how to oppose colonialism. And that's you know, the debate over violence is, of course, um, endemic to that. Okay, so we've got a lot on the table. Um, Post-colonialism, anti-colonial struggle. There's also something called decolonialism nowadays, which you refer to in your paper. Kerry Nelson spoke about anti-Semitism as very much at issue in October 7th. And in the receptions of it on American campuses, which grotesquely were celebrated in some cases. You think in a way, correct me if I'm putting it too bluntly, that what's more interesting here and maybe what it's more all about is our understanding of violence. More than even anti-Semitism, although you don't deny the relevance of, of that. Right. No one, no one would should deny the relevance of it. But yes, I think that we can reveal a dimen a, a critical dimension to what to what we're witnessing if we think about it through this long running discussion over over violence and well, over why vi violence more than anti semitism. Then, uh, first of all. Uh well, well, my my reasoning and rationale for that is that Israel Palestine is not the only locale in which this argument has taken place. Fanon himself never talks about Israel or Palestine. If you, I don't think he mentions it even once throughout his 
entire corpus. And this was not a subject he knew nothing about, right? This was the Algerian, um, the FLN, and the and the, I mean, the PLO didn't exist in, during his lifetime, but they were certainly involved um, and were anti-Zionist. And in fact, um, this was something I learned while reading Adam Schatz's new biography of Fanon. Fanon himself was accused of being a Zionist by one of his rivals um, in Tunisia I um, after he had moved there. Which surprised. Which, which was, was absurd. He? he wasn't. He wasn't a Zionist. No. And Why is it absurd? The, there's just an incredible. Like I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. But um, there's this. He didn't engage in 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 Palestine or Israel or Zionism. It wasn't something he discussed. And in most of what he wrote about violence and anti-colonial strategy was about Africa or North Africa as well. So this was um, I, I this was an argument. And those writing in the eighties and nineties um, during you know what we might call the Fanon Wars also were not all engaged in Israel Palestine, though Edward Said of course was, but they were still. Their their I their thought of where they understood colonialism to be was not situated in Israel Palestine, even if that was one of the locations in which they would put that into. So it was. I think this debate is something that isn't specific to Israel Palestine. There is certain there are certainly aspects to it that are specific, and I think Carrie got to it, and a few others would get to it. But I think this is an angle that is essential in understanding the reaction, at least, to October 7th mm, and okay. to, the, to the subsequent. So we're, we're thinking about the role of violence in politics, but more specifically in anti-colonial struggles yes. and their reception on the American college campus today, even if that seems like an odd juxtaposition, such as our Reality. Sartre was, if not a Zionist, uh, well, a Zionist, actually. Um, well, that's one of the speculations of why Fanon didn't speak about this. But of course, that's just speculation. Um, I don't think Fanon was a Zionist or else he wouldn't have been. I don't think he would have been comfortable um, in mm. the anti-colonial revolution in Algeria. No. If he really but but he was comfortable with Sartre but I, writing with, the preface. Sartre was comfortable with Fanon and Zionism. Right, right. Um, but of course, Fanon's wife, Josie Fanon, was not uh, comfortable with that. Um, very famously, after Sartre supported Israel in the 1967 war, she demanded that the preface be removed from the Wretched of the Earth um, in some editions. So it's it's. I don't think we can say either way, because Fanon, again, didn't write a word about this subject. So I, I think it's we can't really make any claim to it. And I did say before, I think it would have been absurd. It's absurd to call him a Zionist because we just don't know. Um, and and given his other affiliations and given the fact that he was, as far as we know, falsely accused of that um, just by a political rival, I, I think it's important not to, not to speculate carelessly on that question. For decades, Fanon's work has implicitly framed how the Middle East has been understood on college campuses. More generally, it's framed how people understand the psychological and political aspects of collective violence with regards to national resistance struggles. You can really see it operate as a set of basic assumptions, I would say, in the reaction to 10-7, no? particularly on university campuses. A Can certain you... reading of Fanon. Yeah. Okay. Oh, go, well, go all right. I'm glad you said that because here's the, the next thing I was about to say. Explain a bit about who Fanon is and give the more, more, more specifically, since you've said a bit already about who Fanon is and our listeners are, uh, erudite, they know who Fanon is, but can you give the basic intellectual framework? for which he is known, to remind us. Consider the mixture of Marx and Freud, also characteristic of some other thinkers of the uh, bygone days, for example, Marcuse. Who was Fanon in terms of the theoretical frameworks of the day? And, and how, Abe, do those theoretical frameworks of a bygone day come back to haunt us 
this is a double barrel question. Can you can you explain where he was coming from in 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 terms of this mixture, Marx and Freud and so on? And can you explain how that frames receptions of not only his work, but of events? So Fanon came of intellectual age um, in the post-war period um, in, fr in, in France. He had been born um, in 1925 in Martinique, which was a, a colony of, of France, later to become a, a department, and today is a department of, of, of France. Um, and he um, was initially interested when he when he returned um, after when he went after the war concluded and he had certain experiences um, during the war. We don't have to, to get into the details of it that um, really shook his um, identity as a, as a French person. Right. He had grown up in an educational system in, in Martinique that encouraged people to, to see themselves as, as French and to speak French and to think French and to involve themselves in French culture. And his experience in metropolitan France was, was one of racism, right? He immediately saw that he wasn't um, seen as a, as a proper French person, that he was seen as a black man. Um, and that's actually how he started writing. Um, his writing, as he began, was with Black Skin, White Masks, which was initially presented um, as, as his dissertation um, in medical school in, in Lyon. Of course, if one reads Black Skin, White Masks, they'll immediately know it was not accepted as a, as a medical dissertation. It's a, it's a very um, deep psychoanalytic and, and philosophical work. And of course, um, the psychiatry that was being practiced um, and being taught in Lyon at the time was very positivistic. Um, and he had to write something very quickly um, that, that was on a, on a different topic. But he published- I've been there. Skin We've all been masks. there. I, I, right. I, I, he, yeah. he ended up publishing Black Skin, White Masks as a, as a polemical text at the, at the age of 26 or 27. Um, and this was before he ever went uh, to Algeria. He went to Algeria the year after that in 1953 with no intention of, of joining the revolution, even though he had developed ideas about racism and colonialism. At the time, he was still thinking in a very psychoanalytic um, frame uh, of mind and also influenced, um, you know, because the, the most famous chapter in, uh, in, in Black Skin, White Masks is called The Lived Experience of the black man. And I know the term lived experience today is, is used quite a lot, but with Fanon and in the intellectual climate of, of Lyon at the time, he was of course referring to very specific ideas of Maurice Merleau-Ponty um, and lived experience and lived phenomenologies. And, and so this was the, the intellectual environment he came up in, in, in the forties and early fifties. After he arrived in Algeria um, is where he became more politically radicalized. Um, he was practicing um, psychiatry in, in Blida, which is a, a city in, um, outside of Algiers in Algeria. Um, and he um, slowly became more and more sympathetic up to the FLN and began helping them in, in various ways. Eventually, he resigned um, his positions, um, formal medical positions um, and renounced France quite publicly, became uh, a very well-known enemy of France. Um, um, and throughout the 1950s um, was seen, the late 1950s, seen as a spokesperson for the FLN in French and being probably the most prominent um, spokesperson for the FLN, um, served in various positions in the organization, mainly diplomatic ones um, throughout Africa. He was seen as a, as a potential asset by being a Black person um, supporting a uh, primarily Arab uh, revolution in Algeria. Um, in 1960, or 61 rather, he's diagnosed uh, with leukemia. Um, he's dying and ends up um, writing more dictating, but you know that's how he he didn't write himself. He usually dictated things either to his secretary or to his wife, and wrote the wretched of the earth um in a remarkably uh, short period of time. Um, but yeah, that's a, a broad scope of of Fanon's thinking, and it's very hard to disengage his thought from his biography. And if reader, if if viewers of of the podcast and of, of the webinar are interested in learning more about Fanon, they should read the biographies that have been written about him. The recent one by Adam Shatz. 
good. preferences is the new um, one really as new good one's as very good say? but you should also read david macy's biography from i think 2000 or 2001 that was published by verso that's also uh focuses i think more on on aspects of, of fanon um that are are not the wretched of the earth right that's i think what he's most well known for and and you know maybe justly so but I think to get the full scope of, of Fanon's thinking, it's important to understand his life story. And that's also something that I think could help inform us today. Like as someone who isn't Israeli or Palestinian, who injects themselves into a struggle, what regardless of which side one is on in the struggle, th th there's a way to think with Fanon on that. Because Fanon himself you know, he said things like we Algerians, even though he was born in Martinique, he arrived in Algeria as a Frenchman, mm. but mm. still was able to, you know, mm. felt that he had a role to play. And of course, he didn't speak. I mean, he spoke a word of Arabic, but he didn't know Arabic. Right. He was in, in some ways he was an outsider in the Algerian revolution, but also a, a, a critical piece of it. And I think if we're thinking of ourselves as as scholars or thinkers in the West, trying to see how we can, I don't want to use the word inject ourselves because that seems narcissistic and, um, and, and unhelpful, but how we might engage in political questions in outside of our, um, you know, our nations or, or countries or, or political contexts, thinking with someone like Fanon is potentially very valuable. Is there a Zionist? Fanon, uh... it's you know I I'm not sure. I don't think we can say that the contemporary state of Israel is something that Fanon would find um, any sympathy with. Although of course we're we're speaking in the name of the dead, but I think if yeah. we were to take his idea seriously, he would be in the streets demonstrating against Israel at the very least. Oh, I, oh, I, oh I that think, you can say. That much you're I, sure. I think so. I think so. I think not against his sympathy. massacring and uh, people because he I don't know if he would look 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 I think Fanon look, has its look, place. Look, look. He would he would say that I think he would say something like that. But he would also I think insist that when we talk about October 7th and, and the violence committed by Hamas, and I think this we can actually, you know, take from a, a very, you know, surface level reading of his work, that he would say we need to look at violence more broadly, that there's also the violence being perpetrated by the state over many, many years, and you can't just zero in on, on what we might call the violence of the colonized. So I, I don't know if I would say there's a, a Zionist Fanon, but I also don't think we can say Fanon is an inherently anti-Zionist thinker. I think there are, you know, as someone who isn't today, I would say I'm neither Zionist nor anti-Zionist, but I still find Fanon to be a very valuable interlocutor in thinking about the future of, of Israel and Palestine. And in that, in that case, there might be something not of a Zionist Fanon, but maybe of a post-Zionist Fanon, because the Wretched of the Earth, if one reads beyond the first chapter, it's it's a tale of what of of almost a prophetic tale of what will happen in an anti-colonial revolution. Some of it, much of it mistaken. But Fanon's idea is of ends, the teleology of the struggle ends in the emergence of the new man, of something very different. Um, taking place um, in the colonized world, he was not someone who wanted to restore the old world and and to and to kick out the colon the settlers and the colonizers. That was not Fanon's vision. In fact, he's very explicit that that's not his vision. Um, and Adam Schatz makes a very strong argument that had Fanon lived um, to see Algerian independence, he would have eventually been exiled, if not imprisoned, in Algeria, just given his is antithetical views um, about about the revolution and about the the what what you know a post colonial society should look like and how it should function. So there is a, a, a post Zionist Fanon, I think, that we could reasonably posit, but not a, a Zionist or anti Zionist Fanon for the simple reason that he never talked about this. What about Fanon's work as real merit? and what needs to be rejected. What's worth saving? And what, if anything, maybe not? 
So the la on, on the latter point, there is there's a very easy uh, Fanon to reject, and I think that's the Fanon, the middle period of Fanon. So if we look through some of his writings, um, he he wrote polemically um, for the French newspaper of the FLN um, when he was based in Tunisia, and much of that writing. Uh, collected um, in um, toward an African revolution and a dying colonialism, which are, are two collections that are often that were published by Grove Press alongside Wretched of the Earth and, and Black Skin White Masks in, in translation. I think the work in a dying colonialism, I wouldn't say it's completely worthless, but it's much of it is historically inaccurate. Um, it's sociologically mistaken. Um, certain claims that he makes about uh, Algerian society, um, his writing on on the veil, I think, is very you know you could find value in it. But ultimately, we have to understand that this Fanon was an outsider who didn't understand Algerian society, really didn't understand Islam or, or the role of Islam in the, in the revolution um, and, and subsequently um, in, in Algeria. Um, he wasn't, he was someone who deeply, deeply sympathized uh, with colonized peoples, but he often spoke over them, I would say, or tried to speak for them. And I don't think that's uh, an example that we maybe should follow. I, I don't, I, I, that part of Fanon's legacy, I think is genuinely problematic. Um, just, just as a, as a point of scholarship, not even politically at this point, I think we need to engage with the world as it is and try to understand it as best as possible. And I think he might have failed in doing that. Um, he often made very essentialist claims about, um, about Algerian peasants, um, for instance, and, and and he actually had a much better understanding, and then it makes sense that he would of the bourgeoisie in in Algeria, um, because that was the the class in which he mingled. Um, but when he tried to speak of of others, um, in that context, he was usually totally um totally wrong. Um, so that's the Fanon that I would reject. I would also reject um, the selective reading of Fanon that Sartre engaged in and, and that many activists um, engage in, including um, in the 1960s, the Black Panther Party um, published the first chapter of Wretched of the Earth as a, as a standalone publication, which um, I think if one reads the Wretched of the Earth just as a, as a book, just reads it, clearly sees how misleading that would be, that this is not, um, that Fanon is not prescribing anything, certainly not prescribing violence. He's describing violence as, as reality, maybe as inevitable, but he's not celebrating violence in, in any way. Um, and in fact, probably regrets that it, that it ever came to that situation. He sees the colonial violence as being the precipitator of it. He He's not um, sub, an advocate of violence. To call Fanon an advocate of violence, I think, is is to misread him, even deliberately so, um, on the part of some people. So I would reject that Fanon and look toward a, a Fanon who tried to really struggle with the ambiguities and with the 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 sheer um, the sheer pain of of the colonized. I think is something that we could still take from Fanon and to and he had a way of he was he was a brilliant writer um and even in the translations it comes out as someone who really tried his best to to describe the feelings and conditions of of people who lived under colonization and that's what inspired sartre i think in many ways we could say sartre misread um some parts of fanon but i think he grasped the electricity of fanon's prose and 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 fanon's personal deep sympathies um, with the Algerian struggle. You know, someone, you know, a, a highly educated psychiatrist doesn't just walk off the job and, and join a militant group, you know, albeit in a, in a spokesperson capacity, you know, out of sheer want of adventure. This is someone who was clearly moved and changed by his experiences. Um, and so I think that Fanon is, is very much worth preserving. And that's, I think both the Fanon of, of Black Skin, White Masks and The Wretched of the Earth, there's a lot to, to take in and learn from each of those texts.
And also, um, you know, just to, to conclude on that question, there's the the end point. Like when we, if we no longer, and in most of the left today, no longer believes a two state solution is possible, whether that's true or not, is a, a subject for another day. But if one believes that there isn't going to be a two state solution, and that there has to be some that, that the path to Palestinian liberation is within a single polity that will encompass. Israel and and the Jewish people in Israel, I think it's incumbent on advocates of the one state solution to show how that society would be different, how we would create, a, if not a new man, a new political framework that could encompass the interests of all the populations in the country. Um, and Edward Said made some effort um, to doing that. Um, in fact, he created um, the West East Devon Orchestra um, with Daniel Barenboim as kind of a microcosm of what such a society might look like. But in, 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 a, in a bitter irony, of course, the BDS movement boycotts the West East Devon Orchestra today. So I, I think that Fanon is still something, you know, that is reading, I don't even think that's reading Fanon against the grain. I think if we read Fanon with the grain, we come up with something very different than what much of the, the Palestine movement today sees as the end goal of, of their struggle, of, of what Palestinian liberation means. Is Hamas an expression of this kind of desperation of the uh, colonized? The tunnels were decorated apparently with tiling and 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 they had nice furniture. And um, I'm not sure if on campus where people, undergrads and grad students and well professors, seem drawn to the idea that if you, you I don't know what they're thinking, somehow push people so far, what can you expect? They've got to rape and torture and mutilate people. The truth is these tunnels have taken enormous effort over many, many years and a lot of money, and they seem to have been um, upholstered uh, comfortably. Is that is, is that a, a, a Fanonian subject that is some somehow entitled to violence? Well, Fanon never said anyone was entitled to violence. I think we have, have to remind ourselves that it's not a, a prescriptive text. Um, although he does make certain prescriptions of the nationalist bourgeoisie, he wants them to to unlearn their their class interests in a sense. He doesn't say that the colonized should, you know, commit wanton violence. I think it's more that he's analyzing what a situation might what, what will occur in these situations. Um, and when he talks about violence, like if we look at some of his other writings, like a, a speech that he gave in, in Ghana in, in 1960, what he means when he opposes nonviolence, and this was something I learned from, from my teacher, Tony Alessandrini, is that nonviolence is not a tactic when Fanon opposes it. It's an ideology. It's a, it's a way of decolonizing that he saw. And he was actually right about this as a way to entrap um would become former colonies in a dependent relationship with the former metropole. So that's what he was opposing when he opposed nonviolence. He wasn't opposing nonviolent struggle um, as a as a as a form of of anti-colonialism. He was opposed to the negotiated um, decol decolonization of the 1960s. Um, I think one person he had in mind was his former friend Leopold Senghor of Senegal, who pursued that path um, um, toward decolonization. So that was actually what Fanon was opposed to. Um, when it comes to Hamas, it's, it's, again, just hard to say what Fanon would have said about um, any particulars. Um, presumably, he would have been opposed to the ideology of, of restoring Palestine to its pristine pre-colonial culture and, and, and whatever one might say that he wasn't someone who supported that in Algeria. He didn't support that anywhere. He was someone who envisioned a, a completely different world. Um, a new man, a new world, right? That was, he didn't directly engage with Marcuse, I don't think, but in fact, he shared that preoccupation with him of, of creating a new man. And so I, I, he would, I think, be sympathetic 
to the Palestinian struggle. I, I think he would be among the people who would say we need to look at this in context. I'm not, I don't think he, I'm not sure. And I wouldn't say that he would be pro Hamas. I, I can't say that. And of course, if one reads the end of the Wretched of the Earth, which is a, a chapters on, on psyche are basically a collection of psychiatric case studies um, about violence, about how violence affected both the colonizer and the colonized. It's very clear that Fanon is not a, a someone who celebrates violence. And in fact, in the beginning of that chapter, he says, you know, some people might think this chapter is oddly placed in the book, but too bad, you know, it's important to read it. And I, I think that point is, is very crucial and shouldn't be overlooked that while he was sympathetic to the violence of the colonized and to the, and to the struggle of the colonized, he wasn't someone who saw the, these acts as something to celebrate or or to take pride, and he saw it as perhaps something even deeply tragic. What do you say about Fanon and the campus reaction that said that this is what decolonization decolon looks like, or did you think decolonization was just a theory? So I think Fanon might have said a variation of that. He wouldn't say this is what decolonization looks like. He would say this is what colonialism looks like. This is this is the situation one might ex should expect in a situation like this. So I think when it's framed as this is what decolonialism looks like or decolonization looks like, that gives the statement a prescriptive frame that Fanon, I think, assiduously avoids in his work, that it's not something that he's advocating, but he would, I think, be, would, if we're, if we're trying to come up with the most conservative interpretation or, or projection of what he might have thought, would say that this is what colonialism looks like, that, that when you oppress a people like this or, or subject them to, to something like this, this is the reaction to it. And, but he would say, and this would, you know, Find, they would find their their consciousness through this, their national consciousness, and it would eventually, you know, lead to the new man and to a new society. He was, I think, mistaken about that. I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done in order to get us there. But I think that might still be a worthy goal that we shouldn't that we when we see this violence occur, and this is how I've responded to October seventh in a way. That when I see this this horrific violence occur, my my thought isn't how do the, do we defeat this or how do we crush this, which I think is the predominant view in Israeli society right now. But how do we take this reality, which has happened, and in some ways one could say was predicted um, to to happen? How do we take that and, and get to some place better and to potentially some place liberatory? Um, and I think that also explains. Like, you know, there's, there's of course, the very vulgar responses that you mentioned, but I like to think that that's still a minority on the left, that that isn't what most of the left is saying. But the, the fact is that if, if as leftists, we think through, we think with Fanon very seriously, our reaction will be different from that of, say, the Vox Populi in Israel, that we're we're trying to see where this the, where this could potentially lead now that it's happened, and we can't reverse the tragedy and the horrific violence that occurred on October seventh. How do we move from here to a better world or a better Palestine and better Israel? And that's where I think the point of departure for um, someone who takes Fanon very seriously. That's where it would lead them. Violence alone, Fanon wrote, and you quote this in your paper, provides the key for the masses to decipher social reality. And you've just now spoken about uh, violence as an expression of being colonized, uh, if I get you right, um, rather than something that would be celebrated simply because it's an act of resistance to colonialism. The Jews were colonized. You say that in your paper, they 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 were, uh, so to speak, the victims of endo colonization in Europe for many years. They worked to throw off the yoke of the uh, British in uh, Palestine. The famous episode of the King David uh, bombing, which my parents taught me was nothing to be 
proud of, but minuscule on the scale of what terrorism has turned out to be. What if the Jews are colonized historically and Israel's violence is the uh, key for the oppressed masses of Jews to decipher reality? So, so the Jews were colonized. I'm um, not ju- the not just the, in the Middle East, but also in Europe, right? We were in, Jews were an internally colonized population. Um, the most extreme version of of um, colonization was, of course, the the Nazi occupation of, of Eastern Europe. Um, and and so, and there was, of course, um, a violent um, anti colonialism on the part of Jews. I think it's important to 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 puncture the myth. Of of Jews going to the to the slaughter like that, right? We of course have the the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, but also in the in the camps themselves, there were there were uprisings of of Sunder Commando and the like, right? So we're there was a violent um, anti-colonial revolution on the part of of the Jews, and there and 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 of course the Zionist movement itself had certain anti-colonial strands to it, and that's what Pensler et al. were trying to explore in their collection, which met, of course, with the hostile reaction from anti-Zionists. There is a, a you know a part of Zionism that is impossible to understand if you don't think of the Jews as a colonized people in the in in, in at least the European context and after it arrives in Palestine is when it starts to take on you know when it confronts the Palestinian other rather than the the Christian oppressor for the lack of better term in Europe when it confronts the Palestinian other is when is when Zionism begins to become you know a, a less clear-cut anti-colonial ideology and begins to take on at least in my reading a, a more settler colonial um relationship with with Palestinians and so yes, no, you there I, I don't think Israeli state violence can be understood as the as the violence of the colonized. Um I think we have to think of of these contexts as being very specific. Is Jews are are no longer or would Jews are in Europe, but they're not a colonized people in Europe, and Israel is not in Europe. It's it's in a in a very specific Middle Eastern context. And I don't know if I would I think it would be a stretch. To call um, um, a state state violence, of course, Fanon was not writing about state violence, right? He was writing about um, insurrectionary violence and, and violence of, of colonized populations, and and so I wouldn't. I think that would be quite a stretch to say that. But there, there certainly when we and part of my argument is that to understand Zionism, we have to to think um, about its anti-colonial history as well as its settler colonial history, which I think is a part of the story. It's not something that could be ignored or extracted. Um, and and yes, so there there is something to that, but not to I, I wouldn't map on the the discussion of violence to that. We're 7 million Israeli Jewish people in a world of half a billion Arabs and 1.5 million Muslims, if you just look at the map. Are you so sure that Israeli violence is not yet still a, an extension of the struggle of uh, Jews to survive pogroms and Nazism and now the exterminationist and in some ways Nazi-influenced ideology of Hamas? Well, that seems to be the argument of, of Matthias Kunzel, um, for those who want to, to watch the the web the second webinar that, that took place in the Telo series. And it's it's something to think about. It's just not if we're I I wouldn't call anti I wouldn't call state violence anti-colonial violence anywhere. I think we enter a uh, a point where then that these valid struggles are then used politically by by reactionary states and we're not just talking about Israel we're talking about you know oftentimes a, a country let's say like Libya or or Syria or Iran will will frame essentially imperialist violence as being resistance or as being anti-colonial well and now think, you're talking it, about Hamas Iran is Hamas right Hamas right so Iran. but right Hamas is is it's a complicated subject but to, to the, the violence of the state, I think, is something we have to distinguish from the violence of people, of, of, of people often resisting a state. Um, and so it's best not to conflate them for both conceptual reasons, but also, I think, for political reasons that we want. We don't want 
um, these dictators or, or in, imperial powers, frankly, um, to, to be able to take the, full, the, the, the quite just flag of, of anti-colonialism or anti-imperialism. I think that's actually fun on, warned against that. Um, much of the wretched of the earth is a critique of the nationalist bourgeoisie that he predicts will take over um, post-colonial countries um, and, you know, essentially act like the colonizers in many ways. And so if we're actually, again, thinking with Fanon and taking Fanon seriously, I don't think we're just going to embrace the post-colonial state as, as being inherently just or, or inherently um, correct. What is the new man? And why does it depend on violence? And what's it going to look like here between the river and the sea? So, and I, I hope this doesn't sound like a cop out, but it's it's not a question for me to answer. It's a question for those who will who will embody the new man to answer, and that's of course Palestinians and Israelis. I can think of certain models that are taking place um, right now that you know uh, that are Fanonian. I think in 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 their in their conception, um, there's a group in Israel called Standing Together or, or Om Dem Beyachad that while it doesn't take a position on the two, I, I think it supports formally the two state solution, but. I think the model that they offer as a way to think of of equal citizenship or membership in a society is is a Fanonian concept or a path or to to what would be considered a, a post colonial situation. And so those are the kind of you know Om um, or the West East Divan Orchestra, just ways of of interacting and 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 in which a certain new political or civic identity. Can emerge. I think that's the true Fanonian struggle taking place in Israel Palestine. And it's the, the BDS movement when it rejects Omdim Biyachad and rejects the West East Divan Orchestra. I don't think they are acting in the Fanonian tradition. Um, I, I think there are many people who support BDS who are acting in a, in a Fanonian tradition and wouldn't agree with those specific views of of you know the formal bds leadership but that i think is is an anti-fanonian position to reject efforts to try to to create a, a new society out of a, a out of a situation of of colonial oppression whatever one might want to say about that but to think of the post-colonial society as something new and the identity of a member of that society as something new is something that there are palestinians and israelis working toward um, and I support them in doing that, whether or not they support two states or one state. Um, I think that's an effort that's that's worth supporting. Um, but it's not a quite while while I do think that Fanon offers a way for outsiders to to intervene and to think, it's not for me to answer that question of what the new man would look like. That's for um progressives in in Israel and Palestine to to conceive of and to struggle for. And I stand in solidarity with them, but I, I don't think I can give them instruction. You don't worry that it's a fantasy that man is what, what man is? Look, ethno na ethnic nationalism has not existed for eternity, right? This is a, a relatively recent concept in, in history, even if one doesn't prescribe, um, you know, the full Benedict Anderson treatment of the subject. It's still the idea of nation states and and and, and ethnic nationalism is still something uh, a product of modernity, um, and modernity doesn't have to last forever. That we can find a, a new modernity or a post modernity that that encompasses something new and creates something new. And I think as critical theorists, as as people who think with theory. It's it's something that we have an advantage to that we that we're not simply accepting everything as as being you know unaltered from a, from a specific point of origin and that none of this can change that we understand that these identities and these structures are historically contingent they are socially constructed and they can be socially deconstructed um, and that might be where we want to start thinking about this it might very well be a fantasy. But, um, you know, so was Zionism.
you know, this wasn't a, a very natural idea to, 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 to go to Palestine and, and create a Jewish state. It was, in fact, in many ways, a crackpot idea, right, in the, in, the, in the 19th century and even the early 20th century. And so I don't think we should let the, just because something feels unrealistic to us today or, or, or appears, a, a, as you said, a, a fantastical, shouldn't be in itself a, a deterrent. Because I, right now, I'm I'm very skeptical that there's another way out, and I don't want this to end in a victory for either um, the the most hardline Zionist nationalists or the most hardline Palestinian nationalists. I think that's a real disaster waiting to happen. Now, I don't think. The Palestinians could win that struggle anyway, but that's a, a political science question. Uh, but I, I think that the the way toward a peaceful solution has to lie in in these questions that Fanon engaged with, and one of them is what will a post colonial society look like. Um, and whether we want to call it post-colonial or a post-conflict, I think those questions can be elided for the sake of political expediency, if it must be. Um, I, I don't think, you know, I, I think we can build coalitions with all different kinds of, of progressives and people in the region um, and come to some understanding or to a new reality. And that's something that Fanon very much envisioned. I'm just going to ask the dumb question. I'm I'm confused about the colonial, decolonial framework in this context. When it, when we're thinking about small people among other small peoples in in a in a region, you know, dominated by Arab and Muslim imperialism over the centuries. So I think it's important for our purposes that when we're talking about colonialism or, or settler colonialism in, in the case of Israel and Palestine, that we're not talking about people and not, I mean, we are talking about people, but we're not making essentialist claims about identities, right? We're not saying that, or or we shouldn't be saying, rather, there are people who say that, that that all, you know, the Jews are are, are settlers and, and all the Palestinians are, are indigenous people. And this is a binary conflict. That's not how we have to approach the question. We can still, I think, maintain um, their settler colonialism, I view it at least, as a structure and a relationship not about you know essential identities and in that context i think zionism was a settler colonial movement that we can understand it that way um these were you know there were jews continuously in israel that's true but much of the zionist movement much of their their immigration of course came outside of of, of israel and i mean what would become israel what was then at the time palestine and so we do see a settler colonial structure in place. We're not talking about peoples, right? I don't think we're not, I we shouldn't say that Jews are foreign to Israel, though there are people who say that. But I don't think we have to, it doesn't necessarily lead us there if we think with these concepts of settler colonialism. Um, so I I, you know, just to to answer very briefly um on this this question, I don't it's it's very difficult um, to to for me to, to to answer it because I don't think that when I talk about settler colonialism or or, col or coloniality or or you know it's it's converse resistance to colonialism in its various forms in, in, in Israel Palestine I don't think of it the way it's commonly thought of I'm thinking of it as a structure and as a process not as um, not as you know a, a clash between essential identities of, of colonizer and colonizer, a Manichaean struggle that in some ways that's what the colonized feel. And that's something Fanon described very eloquently um, in his text. But if we follow Fanon's life story himself, he what he considered himself Algerian, even though he was born in the Caribbean. He spoke mainly French, um, was not a Muslim, um, even though those were were part of Algerian identity. Um it, it, it what subsequently became um, Algerian civic identity. And so in some ways, Fanon himself could be considered a settler. But of course, that wasn't his understanding of himself. He understood himself as having joined the Algerian people, and he left the door open for Europeans to join the Algerian people. Very famously, he does this in The Wretched of the Earth. 
And so if we, there are understandings of, of colonialism that do take that hard binary structure, but it's not Fanon's understanding of colonialism and anti-colonialism. And I think we need to be very clear about that. Uh, and so I think that if we think about settler colonialism and, and, and resistance to settler colonialism with Fanon in mind, with taking him very seriously and reading him very closely, I think we come to a very different conclusion than those who have, for lack of a better term, have come up with a very vulgar and simplistic notion of what these terms mean. And so to bring this to a conclusion, you write in your paper uh, that uh, well, as you as you conclude, and I'll just ask you to expand a little more on your uh, paper's conclusion. This seems to bring together much of what we've been discussing. You argue that just beneath the surface, and I quote, of the rhetorical salvos about the Israel-Hamas conflict is a struggle over Fanon, and more broadly over post-colonialism, specifically at the heart of the matter, is a question of the utility of radical post-colonial theory. Is it supposed to help us better understand the legacies and continuing practices of colonialism or to provide or to provide theoretical justification for practical resistance? Who's post-colonialism. Now you pose that question, you explore that question in your paper, and I don't mean to ask you to, 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 to distill uh, it so uh, much, uh, your argument that the nuance is lost, but can I ask you your own question? Um, practical resistance or, or better understanding? Uh, what is it that this theory ought to be used for i'll give the cop how to answer and say i think there we don't need to choose, necessarily have to choose right if one is engaged in a in a political struggle of any kind it's i think always to their advantage to be better informed to better understand the dynamics at play so I don't think that that one has to necessarily choose a side between there. However, if one primarily is interested in political struggle and sees post and, and might see post-colonial theory then as a way to obfuscate um, the the questions at hand, and that was often the criticism that was made of of Homi Baba and, and Gayatri Spivak in the late eighties when they were writing about Fanon that they were you know using him for their post structuralist, i.e., a political interpretation of of post colonialism and, and 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 literary theory at the time. And so there is that react. That was the reaction that I was trying to to suss out. That there was this this again, like people who read Fanon primarily as as a way to to engage in struggle. And this was also oftentimes the Marxist reading of of Fanon was to was to you know to see him as as being engaged in a search because because Fanon himself was influenced by Marx, but was not a not a, an orthodox Marxist by any means. He saw, you know, for example, the lumpen proletariat as being a very important agent of change, which is not something an orthodox Marxist would ever say. But he, you know, stretched Marxism was his words. And that tradition of reading Fanon, I think, is somewhat hostile um, to the uh, to the more, you know, theoretical or to the more historical or to try to to use Fanon's ideas to better understand um, colonial societies or post-colonial um, um, societies and anti-colonial struggle. And so um, I think there, there, that, that tension is always going to be there, but I don't think just, you know, I, I, you know, Homi Baba, I don't consider to be a, a reactionary or, or a conservative at all, right? This is, you know, this is a debate in, in some sense within the radical left. And I and I I do you know my sympathies are clearly with the war uh, psychoanalytic or or historicization of of Fanon's writings and to use that as a way to understand this 
our world better and also, you know, Israel-Palestine better. I'm not sure Fanon, if read faithfully and completely, could be used for more practical purposes. I, I think it's very, my reading of Fanon, at least, is that it doesn't lend itself naturally to that, even if his his soaring and, and beautiful language is in some ways seductive in that regard. I don't think Fanon could be credibly sought as a as a prescriber of tactics or as someone who encourages those binary views that we were discussing before. And so that's that's where I come down on this question, that yes, we should better understand um, our world. And through that, we might also be more effective political actors. Okay, and that uh, brings us to the end of our interview. It's the new man versus the new Jew, it turns out. Zionism was meant to produce the new Jew, a uh, gender-neutral term with great, um, you know, uh, with, with, with a great um, idea about feminism as integral to the Zionist movement, I think it's fair mm -hmm. to say. Uh, we, we, we wrap up now and we conclude, I guess, with our present reality, the new uh, man versus the the, the new Jew. And we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Abe, I cannot thank you enough for spending uh, this time with us so generously to go into detail about your really important, really interesting work. We'll be hearing more from you on this, I know. And 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 um, I look forward to future uh, conversations. Would that everyone who engaged with this material was as careful uh, thoughtful, uh, nuanced as you, and um, would that uh, everyone who who argued about these things as passionately as you do were were um, such a match uh, uh, on top of it all? I can't uh, again say thanks enough. Now, don't leave just yet. I'm not just end the recording. Sorry, I kept you longer than you meant to. I'm sorry. No, I knew it's, you it's okay. It's okay. But it was still, it, was, it, 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 it went very beautiful. well, I thought. Didn't it? it yeah. Went, I, I thought it went very you. well. Yeah, I, 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 I very much thought this went very well. Uh, you, you and I think just... in part because of your restraint on certain points. Weren't you surprised? Were you surprised? I find I was pleasantly surprised. Yes. No, because um, I, I think it was, wanted... I think it was very well. Yeah. I think oh. I, I enjoyed this conversation. Oh, you made my day. Really? I, really, really. I, mm -hmm. I wanted to do this right because uh, for, for many reasons. Um, yeah. 